How y'all doing tonight? You doing good? Doing good? Nothing like telling stories with wine. All we need is like a fire and some marshmallows. If you ever feel like you are in a rut, or your friend's in a rut, like the, just, the mountain just keeps going, keep in mind three weeks ago, I was dancing in the sprinkling rain of Mardi Gras for the first time in my life, or six years before that, I was in a cult that prayed for rain. Oh, uh, yes, as Monica said, I've never shared this bit of depth before in a public forum. And I'm very excited, slightly nervous, not about speaking, but about trying to present something that's rather intense. And yet I try to be freaking hilarious because I like to laugh and I like to make people laugh. Yeah, yeah, OK. So. One of the best ways to kind of start this unfolding of my life journey is I want you to be on it with me. Sound good? OK. So there's this metaphor, and I feel like we can all relate to it. And it has helped me kind of help unravel my life and make it better. And if you take this metaphor, it will help your life and your children's life. Share it with everyone you know. I stole it from somebody. Her name's <laughs> Debbie Ford. But when I finally, after nine months of reading the book, I got to page 27 and found the metaphor and she stole it from somebody else, so it's okay. And then it goes like this, that when you're born, you're born a castle with a thousand rooms. And in each and every one of those rooms is a gift waiting just for you. And you're all excited, you're limitless, you're fearless. You're like two years old and there is no shame, there is no guilt, there is no fear, and you're running through the castle that is your life. And you're like, oh my God, this is joy. Ooh, that's pizza. And you're going through and you're experiencing all the emotions that it is to be human and all the things you get to do with it, like garden, play in the dirt, see the bugs, the animals, the breeze, everything. Put your toes in the ocean. But then what happens? Your parents come along and they say, we don't really use that room over there. And your friends come along at the playground, they're like, we don't really use that room over there. And then your teachers come along. <laughs> and by the time we reach adulthood, we believe we are nothing more than a two bedroom apartment that needs work. <laughs> but you are a castle. A big, glorious castle. And your whole entire life is about going into those rooms and unlocking the doors. Sometimes that represents itself in therapy. Sometimes it's tequila. Whatever you use to unlock those doors, I guarantee you, your life will be richer for doing it. Now, I, this glorious castle, grew up in the buckle of the Bible belt. I grew up where there were more churches and more Christians than there were people. I believed, I believed, I believed. I slept with my Bible. I went to church not only Sunday, but I went Monday. I went Monday for prayer, Tuesday for choir, Wednesday for midweek service, Friday for youth group, and sometimes Saturday for a barbecue. That is the South. If you ever been to the South, you go to the car park, I mean, to get the petrol out, you go to fill up your petrol, you know what there is in the bathroom on your way? Stack of Bibles. You can't escape it. You ask somebody how they are in the South, you know what they'll tell you? I'm blessed and highly favored. There is like Christianese everywhere. And I was part of it. I believed it. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a preacher. I came to Australia, guess what? To go to Bible school. I studied ancient Hebrew, shalom. I studied ancient Greek, named my kid, Rhema. And it was just wild. But in that process, I was a big people pleaser because I realized at 19, before moving to Australia, that there was one big problem. I had never been attracted to a guy. And in the South, that is a death sentence. And then I went to a university of all women. <laughs> you would have th thought be like a kid in a candy store, but no, not when you love Jesus like I did. It was like I would get up and fast every single day before art class when the pretty girls were in my art class because I didn't want to think wrong thoughts. I would physically beat myself in the face if I thought thoughts that were not like I was raised to think. 
coming from a 13 year old that when I said the, the word shit at 13, I washed my own mouth out with soap. Can you imagine your kids doing that today? <laughs> And so there I was in this complete dichotomy of here I wanted to believe what I wanted to believe, but yet there was this, uh, this demon. So what did I do? I was a good Christian girl. I submitted myself to conversion therapy. 20 years. It is the most dehumanizing, brainwashing thing that, thank God, for March 22nd, 2024, New South Wales as of last week, has said it is a criminal offense. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> so what it looks like, if you're ever, if you've kind of, because I bet, just raise your hand if you're curious, what does that actually entail and look like? Okay, so it looked like over the course of those 20 years, I had like 50 pastors trying to cast demons out of me. Because it is a spirit of perversion. There's something wrong with you that can be cured. And guess what? Then after they get into your history, they're like, oh, your, your mother had depression and wasn't emotionally available. It's her fault. You're gay. They would blame it on parents for what you dealt with because they thought it's definitely curable. And when you're taught and when you're con like in that environment, you honestly believe that it can be cured. So I met this guy that I like playing basketball with, and I brought him to church with me. And they're like, that is your husband, says the Lord. And I felt accepted. So I married him because a good Christian girl doesn't actually, like, try before she buys. Yeah, that honeymoon was an interesting experience. I was like, that's, uh, I'm definitely gay. And I, like, signed my life away. And I went into the darkest depression you can fathom. And I spent my hours at Bible school thinking about suicide. And it was this constant, constant battle. 12 years of marriage, two beautiful children. And I would be performing on the stages of these churches as, as a prophet, as a prophetic artist. And I'd get these visions and I'd paint them. And I had this moment where I was like, wait, I'm actually still performing when I get off stage because I have to keep faking it till I make it every single day, day in, day out. And I'd read my little girls the story of Cinderella, and I'd read them all these little stories about the prince, and I would try to be fighting back the tears because that wasn't my, I never had that fairy tale. You might know you're gay when you're a little kid and your dream was not to be Princess Leia. I'm an 80s kid. My dream was to be Luke Skywalker, rescuing her. And when your heart starts racing as Ariel comes out of the water with this cute little seashells on her titties, <laughs> you might know you're gay. I started writing all these jokes back when I was in that mixed orientated relationship of you might know you're, if you're a lesbian, you might know you're a lesbian if. I should really publish it, there's a lot of them. <laughs> But to wind it all down, comes down to 2017 Boxing Day. My husband and my two girls and I, we went to go see The Greatest Showman. Beautiful film, right? He's a creative, I was a creative, we had two girls. And he saw a different movie than I saw. He saw this creative couple with two girls living their creative dream. You know what I saw? the bearded lady singing This Is Me. And that soundtrack got down so deep into my soul. I put it on repeat. December 26, I put it on repeat like six hours a day. By February 8th, I looked at him and I said, you deserve a woman that can love you for you, and as do I. And I left with $24 and a suitcase. And I moved in next door so I could still be a mom. <laughs> and thankfully, I had a, a family that took me in and just let me kind of work things out. And unfortunately, right after that, I decided I would fall in love with the first person that I met. And it was an abusive relationship for three years. And then in 2021, I met Liz. 
and it has a happy ending. <laughs> When she met me, I'll wind it down with this. When she met me, she goes, uh, you don't want to date me. And I looked at her, I was like, wait till you hear my story. You don't want to date me. <laughs> and then within three weeks, we're like, I can't imagine life without you. And we have seven teenagers between us. And uh, life is interesting and colorful and beautiful, but I identify as a loving human. And it's just going to work. And it's just Freaking, freaking beautiful. And I processed my pain through art. And I processed my life and my love through art. And this was just one of those moments when I was reflecting on what the church experience was. And if you come up close, you'll notice there's a lot of eyeballs in jars, including the pastor who's missing his eyes. Because in the church, you give your heart, your soul, everything to Jesus, everything. So I never thought about making decisions on my own. I always asked Jesus what he wanted me to do with the day from the very beginning. And so the whole concept of have a go, you mug, was just mind-blowing. I loved it. And I came to this country, and I've been happy and free now for two years. And I'm really excited to have shared my weird story with you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.